Robot Talk is the podcast that sits down with robot enthusiasts from around the world and asks them the questions you always wanted answered. Like, can I help you design a robot? And how does that thing work? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Robot Talk. I'm your host, Claire Asher. And this week, I'm finding out about human-robot interaction and how robots can be designed with user input to improve accessibility and uptake. Before that, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to Robot Talk through your favourite podcast provider. It really helps the podcast and means you'll be the first to hear the latest episodes. Another way to find out about new episodes is our email newsletter, which you can sign up to on our website by going to robottalk.org. So, with all that said, it's time for me to introduce this week's guest. I recently had a fascinating discussion with Maria Jose Galvez Trigo from Cardiff University, all about human robot interaction, machine learning, and accessibility. This week, I'm speaking to Maria Jose Galvez Trigo, a lecturer at Cardiff University researching human robot interaction and machine learning. Hi, Maurice. Lovely to have you on the podcast. Hello, Claire. Thank you for having me. You're applying machine learning to various aspects of human robot interaction. So, to get us started, can you tell us about some of your recent projects? So, most of my work actually revolves around accessibility. Mm -hmm. And the areas in which I apply machine learning is areas that happen around improving accessibility. Okay. Um, it could be accessibility of the world around us, the technology that we use using robotics, or about also making the interactions with robotic systems more accessible for everybody and anybody, really. Mm -hmm. um, some of my current work focuses on improving more specifically how we can communicate with robots and on exploring the multimodality of these interactions and this communication so that people that struggle using a specific modality, for instance, uh, can still communicate successfully with a robot. Mm. And this could be at home, this could be uh, at school, it could be in a public space, for instance, these hotels or restaurants that have service robots to help clients, or it could even be at the workplace because many jobs nowadays require working closely with a robot in a collaborative task. Mm. Um, so that's the areas where I apply machine learning mostly. Um, because, for instance, um, in communication, it's the two-way interaction, right? It's not yeah. just you telling the robot to do something. Uh, the robot needs to interpret what you want to say and then do something in return. And it could be replying or it could be just um, doing an action, performing mm. an action. Um, this is not as easy, especially when we are talking about uh, accessibility, because then we are bringing into play a lot of dif different aspects, people that may not interact with the robot in the way that I will interact with the robot, for instance. Mm. And it could be based on cultural uh, background. It could be based on... I don't know, for instance, somebody that may have a hearing impairment or a speech impairment. So it is very important uh, to use different uh, methods and different modalities to model this interaction so that the robots can understand everybody and anybody can interact with these robots. Yeah, we've we've touched on this a few of these issues before in the podcast in terms of like just the complexity of of human interaction and it's it's so much more than just the words that we use you can say the same sentence with a different tone of voice and mean something completely different but a lot of that is often not necessarily picked up by a robot exactly and sometimes even the voice that a robot produces or a system produces can be um affecting the world around you or yourself for instance having um device with an american accent it can be perceived mm. differently depending on the country where you are um yeah. so that is also an aspect that needs to be considered when you are designing uh, a system um also we have situations a bit more complex such as 
interacting with people that have tremors, for instance. Mm. Um, there are a lot of people doing amazing research in handing over uh, of objects between a robot and a person. But how could a robot handle handing an object back or picking up an object from a person that has tremors? Yeah. They'll have to use machine learning to figure out what is the correct way. So it's, it's a lot of aspects that I find amazing. Mm. And I really enjoy exploring. Yeah. So how does machine learning help? What does that bring to the table that kind of more traditional programming approaches don't? So more traditional programming approaches is basically an instruction. So you tell the robot to do something and it's going to do it in that way. Um, let's say, for instance, give me a glass and the robot is going to bring you a glass. but Maybe if you pre-program it, it's always going to be the same glass that is mm. always at the same place. But what if it's different people asking for that glass? And that is a very simple example. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, machine yeah. learning can help that robot make sense of past interactions as well. So that when the specific person asks for something, it brings the thing that that person wants. And that happens often in interactions between humans as well. Um, I mean, I don't know how about you, but for instance, my mum would often say, bring me that. And it's like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and over the years, you learn to figure out that when she said, bring me that in a certain uh, situation or circumstances, she means a specific thing. Mm. So machine learning helps robot make sense of those commands and those tasks in a similar way. Of course, it's not perfect. Um, it's not like a human could do it but it brings us a bit more closely to that. Yeah. So I guess if you wanted to kind of mimic that level of complexity without machine learning, you'd have to kind of program in every possible instance yeah. and every combination of a lot of different things. And also you could have to be terribly specific when you ask for something. Yeah, that's true. And that is, it doesn't fit within our daily lives if we need to give super complex and super specific uh, directions to robots that, although nowadays are not with us like everywhere, we start to see them more often. So mm. uh, I have a robotic vacuum cleaner, for instance. Yeah. A lot of uh, people have smart speakers at home and you talk to them and little by little, there are newer technologies, newer robotic systems that we have to interact with so yeah obviously we want the interaction to fit within our life and uh, within how we interact with the environment currently and not having to learn <laughs> terribly long instructions and remember how they are for each specific device yeah yeah I guess that comes back to what you were saying about um accessibility in terms of it just being easy to interact with and not requiring like a degree in robotics to, to be able to give the right commands. Yeah, exactly. And it's accessibility for everybody, really, because even when you have a day that is a bit busier, mm. you probably don't have uh, the brain capacity to interact with a piece of technology in the same way or yeah. to liaise with things the same way. So it's, it's accessibility for everybody, really. Yeah, definitely. So one area you've done quite a bit of work on is um, robotics and AI being deployed at special schools for children with autism or learning difficulties. So how are robots being applied in this area and, and what have you learned about um, human-robot interaction from working with the children in these schools? Indeed, that's how I started my research journey. I think it was 2012 or 2013. I mm. did my master thesis at Nottingham Trent University. And I was very lucky to be supervised by Professor David Brown from the Interactive Systems Research Group. Mm. And I also uh, work with Penelope Standen, which then later became my PhD supervisor. She was mm. based at the University of Nottingham. And they introduced me to... Um, special schools and to the importance of working closely with the users of any system that you may be creating. And in this case, it was working with children and it was working with teachers as well. Mm. And it was children aged five to 18. And the particular schools I was working with, they gathered for children with so many different type of needs. Mm. It was at the beginning, it was quite difficult um, to figure out how to navigate that. 
Yeah. But it was very, very enriching. I learned a lot because you learned that a lot of assumptions that you have about how you should design something that is good, for instance, mm. and then suddenly they don't work. <laughs> you were wrong. You were completely wrong. <laughs> and the things that you thought were super accessible are not. And the things that you thought um, that child would find amazing, they find them super boring, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> mm. So, so yeah, I learned a lot about how you shouldn't assume um, that what you know is what the person that is going to use the system that you design knows or wants to do with that system. Mm. Um, children attending these schools often have those very complex learning difficulties. And like most people, uh, like you and like me, um, they need motivation. They also like technology, like any yeah. other children. That All children in general, I think, uh, most of them love technology and they're actually quite good with technology. I give yeah. a phone to my four-year-old cousin and he learns how to do things quicker than yeah. any other adult <laughs> that I yeah. know. Um, and the same applies to children attending special schools. And often um, some people think that, oh, but they they should be using, if they cannot interact with uh, this uh, tablet application, for instance, they can use an assistive technology. And assistive technologies, um, some of them are very tacky, are like very big devices that are mm. connected to a computer or to a tablet so that you can actually interact with them. But sometimes we don't realize that a computer, a robot, a mobile phone, they are already assistive technologies and yeah. children will prefer to use this as opposed to using those tacky Mm. other assistive technologies and I've learned that actually if you consider that from the very beginning or when you design something it's not that difficult to make things accessible. Mm. And so what what kind of robot or robots were the, the kids interacting with at the school? So we had different robots that we brought into the schools. Um, one of them it's called Now uh, from Aldebaran Robotics they okay. used to be called SoftBank Robotics. Now they're back to Aldebaran. Um, it's like a small humanoid robot. Is I could say like a toddler uh, okay. in terms of height. Um, it has several sensors. Um, it has arms. It's got legs as well. Um, it produces sound. It has microphones, so you can program it to interact using speech as well. And to be honest, it looks very cute. <laughs> and that's the, the first robot that we were working with. But then because that robot was very expensive, and I'm mm. talking about around £7,000, wow. we introduced cheaper robots, uh, mm. such as the Lego Mindstorms and some other robots. One of them is called ESET or Easy because it comes from Canada, uh, JD. And it's a smaller humanoid uh, that actually... If you break one of the parts, you can easily 3D print them and fix them. Oh, brilliant, yeah. And um, we didn't see that it made too much of a difference for the children, although we didn't study it uh, properly, but something mm. that I wanted to. Um, and they really enjoyed interacting with the robot overall. Um, teachers were very interested in using them because, as I said, it's, it's something that motivates them and in special school, especially for children that have more complex needs, they want to teach them the skills for life. Yeah. So they want to motivate them to learn how to, I don't know, do stretchings in the morning, um, how to uh, follow their routine that you need to follow to uh, wake up in the morning, have breakfast, get dressed mm. and get all ready to go to school. Um, all those things that one may think, oh, they're very simple. But if you have a tool that motivates them more, they might get it more easily or more mm -hmm. quickly. And they may want to learn more things, more complex yeah. things. So it was a, a teaching aid, basically. Yes. Uh, we don't want to replace teachers. I think it would be a mistake <laughs> yeah. to replace teachers with a robot. Um, but we saw and teachers told us that they saw the robots as a very useful teaching tool. Mm -hmm. Similar to an iPad, but more versatile. Yeah. Okay. 
I wonder if, I mean, I don't know how long you, you spent um, working with these kids. Um, usually these projects, you know, aren't, aren't not the kind of thing that go on for years and years and years and years. But I wonder if there's like a novelty aspect where like at first the kids would be really excited to learn from the robot because it's something they've not necessarily interacted with before. It's like a new toy. And maybe if you come back after five years or whatever, they'll be like, yeah, it's just, it's just part of the furniture now. <laughs> That's a good point. And at the beginning, we didn't really know if that was going to be the case. But as I mentioned, um, David Brown and Penny Stanton, they taught me that it's important to have like a, a long lasting relationship mm. with the people that you want to help. So whilst I did my master's thesis at uh, it's the Oakfield School in Nottingham, and I work with teachers and pupils at the school back in 2013, um, up until the point when I moved to Cardiff, I kept working with that school, same oh, pupils, really nice. same yeah. teachers. I saw some of them growing up and you could tell that um, even in different projects, exploring different things, um, it didn't seem that it was the novelty aspect what brought them to mm. be more motivated by the robot because they were already familiar with it. For them, it was another tool that they yeah. had another technology that they had in the classroom and they knew they could use for certain things. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you kind of managed to keep in touch with them. Mm -hmm. So a key aspect of this work that you've mentioned is um, improving accessibility. Um, and the process that you've used for that is called co-design. So um, could you explain how co-design works? Um, and how it can inform the design of more accessible robotic systems. Yes, of course. So more often than it should happen, we have somebody designing something, whatever it is, and they assume what the users need or may struggle with, and sometimes mm. maybe based on personal experiences or on a short questionnaire. Um, they call it gathering requirements, and that's fine. Um, but the thing is that uh, we are so different. And yeah. we have so many factors that can affect how we interact with something that making those assumptions can result in systems that are not very accessible. Um, we have to consider, for instance, um, cultural factors that I mentioned before, mm. age, um, language barrier, uh, any other impairments that could be even acquired uh, with age. Um, and co-design um, helps us actually design together with those that are going to use the technology how that technology should behave and should look like. So I think co-design is something that needs to happen from a very early stage. Mm -hmm. Even when you are designing a project idea, you can engage with users, with those that you think are going to benefit from your research and from whatever it is that you're developing, and brainstorm what the project should be about, what are the main pillars that you should touch upon and that you should explore. And then, of course, throughout the design process of that technology, engage with them, but not just designing something, uh, bring it to them and asking them, do you mm -hmm. like it? Do you think it's good? No, more having a um, constant relationship where they can gain that trust that enables them and allows them to be honest with you, to criticize whatever mm. it is that you're doing, if they don't think it's right, uh, to suggest new things, to be active designers as well. And um, that is what core design is about, but it doesn't end with uh, the deployment of a product, for instance. It should continue mm. afterwards. It's quite challenging because it yeah. is not easy to, uh, to find the time because it's very time consuming to engage with users for such a long time, but it's also time consuming for them. Mm, so yeah, it's, exactly. it's difficult and depending on who you are going to be working with, it is very, very tricky to manage to find people that you can create that relationship with. But if you manage to do it, it can be very good because the result is getting systems that are better fit for what they are supposed to do. Yeah. I guess I imagine another challenge would be the kind of finding the language to talk to each other about things, because obviously, you know, as a roboticist, you have very deep technical understanding of the system, which many users would not have. 
So you need to find that kind of common ground where you can have a conversation with them that's meaningful for both of you. Of course, and that's often one of the biggest challenges. Because if you go to, let's imagine you are doing research with older adults um, and you go to them and they don't have a technical background and you start talking about uh, sensors and ROS, the robotic operating <laughs> systems, and and a lot of technology or research um, grounded words, and they will not understand. So exactly. that is very tricky. Um, so I think something very important to do this kind of work is having a very open mind and trying to adapt. Uh, be conscious that not everybody knows what you do, but mm. also you will not know everything that your users know. So yeah. you also need to be open-minded to be corrected, to uh, be explained mm. um, what they mean by some things. It, it's very tricky, but having an open mind always helps and flexibility. And it's a very interdisciplinary kind of work. So you often have yeah. in this co-design process people involved that are not just the technical people. You mm. often have psychologists or clinicians uh, besides the end users. And that really helps because if you reach a situation where you are stuck, you don't really know how to translate something you want to do from the technical jargon to uh, something that is easier to understand for them, they can sometimes intervene and help you. And yeah. I think it's important to have that interdisciplinarity there. Yeah, definitely. I imagine there must be some really interesting conversations that happen in that kind of um, environment. Oh, yes. <laughs> and realizations like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you think are the biggest barriers to the uptake of new robotic systems? Well, that's something that it is a very good point. It's something that I'm very interested on, um, improving the uptake and exploring why the uptake of robotic systems is not as good as we would want it to be in mm. certain areas. And it greatly depends on the area. I started exploring this with my PhD, working with uh, the schools closely. I figured that uh, working closely with them was probably going to be one of the best ways of finding out what mm. the problems that uh, we had with the uptake were. Um, I got some hints, but I'm still trying to figure out how to do these things better. Mm -hmm. And one of my PhD students, Alex Elias, is, for instance, exploring how to improve the uptake of uh, robotic systems uh, that are interactive, so the in human robot interaction context, mm. uh, for agriculture. Because okay. we have robots that are great, um, but the uptake is still lagging behind, for instance, the uptake that we have in the automotive sector. Yeah. And he's uh, running a very interesting study comparing the two industries, trying to see mm. if we can learn something to increase and improve the uptake in agriculture. And it's not just in that area, in healthcare, in social care. We had, for instance, some years ago, I read on the news, they deployed a pepper robot which is a very mm. cute robot that is yeah. sort of humanoid, a social robot. They deployed in a Scottish supermarket. But that okay. robot, at that point in time, uh, was programmed to understand American accent uh. and to speak with an American accent. <laughs> so obviously you bring it to your place that has an accent that is very different to the American yeah. accent. And people couldn't interact with it. So I think it lasted like a couple of days and they had to take it away. Um, yeah. So... Those are some of the factors. And also culturally, um, we need to explore those aspects as well. Um, the price mm, uh, in yeah. education, that's something that I saw was a massive problem, mm. a massive barrier. And whilst, for instance, in industrial settings, it might not be such a big deal. Um, in some other settings, such as education, when a school has a very small budget compared to a multinational uh, company, then yes, it's a very big factor. So it, it depends on the area. Um, yeah, of course. But it's, it's something that I'm still working on, <laughs> mm. on figuring out. Do you think an element of it is that people aren't really aware of the potential benefits? So they sort of are maybe aware vaguely that these technologies exist, but don't really understand the details yeah. of how it could help? And I think sometimes the problem comes from a realistic marketing, yeah. science fiction, and the expectations that we have from uh, 
what we've seen on TV or what we've read on a book when we face interacting with a robot. Because if if they create an unrealistic expectation for us, then we're probably going to be disappointed the yeah. first time we interact with a robot. And that, believe it or not, happens quite often in several studies where I have interviewed uh, participants. At the beginning, we had asked them what they expected the robot could do. Mm. And then we asked the same questions at the end. And often you could see that it changed a lot. At the beginning, yeah. their expectations were super high, like, Pwah! The robot is going to be amazing. <laughs> and yeah. then towards the end, it was a bit like, yeah, well. It's okay. <laughs> it, I don't think it's going to replace me in my job anytime soon. And those kind of things. Yeah. I mean, that can be reassuring as well. <laughs> yeah, it can be reassuring. But at the same time, it can slow down the progress and the adoption of these technologies. Also, yeah. bad past experiences. If the first time you get a robot and you interact with it, it does a terrible job, how likely are you going to be to buy the newer generation, for instance? Mm, yeah, Especially yeah. because they cost a lot of money. So it's yeah. an investment. And, and we, we're talking about robots that we have at home, like the robotic vacuum cleaner. If you buy one that doesn't do anything right, that doesn't really clean anything, <laughs> and it bumps onto every object and breaks it, uh, maybe yeah. the next one you're not going to get it and you're going to stick to the uh, more older version of the vacuum cleaner. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Marisa, it's been really fun chatting to you today. I've been talking to Maria Jose Galvez Trigo, a lecturer at Cardiff University. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Robot Talk, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast and leave a review to let us know what you think. And if you've got a question you'd like me to ask one of my future guests, you can contact us on social media at Robot Talk Pod or visit robottalk.org. We regularly announce upcoming guests, and I'd love to include your robotics questions, whether they're super basic, a bit silly, or even quite profound, in my next interview. Next week, I'm talking to Edward Johns from Imperial College London, all about robotic manipulators learning, and artificial intelligence. Until then, I've been Claire Asher, and this has been Robot Talk. Robot Talk is brought to you by the Hamlin Centre, Imperial College, London. <laughs>